Hello everybody and welcome. Welcome to Let's Play Crusader Kings 2. Yes indeed, here we are. This music, boy, it gets you in the mood to kick some backside, doesn't it? So dramatic. Right, before we start the LP, if you watched the introductory video, you know exactly what this LP is all about, and if you didn't, well, you might have to get up to speed with a few things. And I would also like to thank Lucasy for gifting me, uh, at Christmas, a whole host of downloadable content for this game. Face packs, music packs, Legacy of Rome, and Sword of Islam. So this combination of DLC should give us a few extra things to do, even though we're not playing um, as, a, as, a, as a Byzantine Lord or the Byzantine Emperor. We're not playing as a, a Muslim faction, but I think those expansions still give you a, a few extra features here and there, even if you play as somebody else. So thank you for, for, the, for the gifts. Without further ado, I've talked and introduced for long enough. I think it's time to delve in to the campaign proper. Now I haven't played this campaign with the Flemings for about four months. So I'm going to have to refresh myself as to what happened when I left off. Now, as I've already stated in the introductory video, I will try and explain the various functions of the game, but that will only be done as and when they occur, because if I was to sit here and go through every minute feature of the game, it would take me at least an hour, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of depth to this. So my aim is to go through things slowly and steadily, and um, <clears throat> just, just basically go through things as they crop up. If you have any questions about any of the features that I'm using, that you are clarifying, Ask a question on the comments page and I will do my best, as I'm sure other people will as well, to clarify that feature. Because I am aware that a few people haven't watched this, uh, or haven't played this game before. <clears throat> so, where do we start? Well first of all, we have the campaign map view. There's a variety of views we can use here to get a look at the various aspects of the campaign, such as diplomacy, such as uh, opinions, uh, economy, and as I say, all of these will come into into fruition as I as I use them. But my my primary uh, tab that I use is is the independent realms. Independent realms tab gives us an overview of the various independent realms in the world. England is the independent kingdom. There you see Scotland. You have Ireland is broken up into a variety of counties and duchies. And if we look closer, with the independent realm tab um, in use, we can see that Norfolk and Northumberland are not quite in the same colour as England itself and that is because they are trying to vie for independence. As we can see down here there is a war of Norfolkian, 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 <laughs> how do you pronounce this without sounding offensive? War of Norfolkian independence and also a war of Northumbrian independence um, is, is currently ongoing. That is because, as I said in my backstory, King William the Conqueror, recent conqueror of the English lands, when he conquered, obviously a lot of people weren't happy with the fact that their previous king had been deposed. England is predominantly Saxon. If we look at the uh, cultures tab, we can see the various cultures of the world, and you can see that England is predominantly Saxon, which means that this Norman king that has come into power doesn't quite sit well with, uh, with the Saxon populace. So that is why there's a little bit of trouble. So uh, basically these two are vying to pull away from English rule. Now as we can see the war score, the war score down here, this is a percentage. The war score is influenced by battles, uh, um, victory in battles, and also how many lands you conquer. And I think because it's negative and we're allied with England, I think this means that these two factions are currently winning their wars. Although with this 2000 stack English troop force in the field, I'm sure we, as England, will eventually win the war and bring these two independent counties back under English rule. So that is a little bit about what's happening in the land of England and that's why there's units in the field and that's why there's a few borders and a few bits of smoke happening here. There is a war going on. Okay, so we'll, we'll track that as it, as it progresses. 
Speaking of the king, I just want to quickly go through, uh, obviously he is a king of England, he's a Norman, he's the house de Normandy. As you look at his vassals, just a little bit more about the backstory here, we can also see that there's a few people here in prison. The Count of Northampton, York, Leicester, Lancaster, this just gives you a little bit of an inkling as to just how bad a problem this has been, this, this civil war. All of these people have been in prison because they tried to raise up and claim independence from English rule and failed miserably. Myself, George Fleming, along with other counts and dukes that were loyal to the king, including the king himself, have been trying to quell these, these claims and we have done a very good job thus far and we have managed to clear, we have managed to uh, imprison four people and there's two more to go as I'm sure we can we can carry on in the same vein whether or not the king decides to kill these execute them ransom them off or just leave them to rot in the cells it's up to him on the other side of the coin the vassals that have a high opinion of the lord obviously duke william of normandy he is a distant relative of the king i think he's some sort of cousin or uncle he's he's a family member he's part of the same house he's not a direct family member but he is uh, a distant family member which is probably why he has the highest opinion but second in line look at us we have the king's uh, good grace really we we, uh, we have a high opinion of the of the king mainly because of the fact that he bestowed upon us the the title of count and also because the title of the chancellor of england as well we also get along because of our traits we're both diligent, or oh, he's diligent, he's just, and he's brave, and we have a good opinion of those type of traits. So, uh, we have a good opinion of the, of the king, which is why we are doing his bidding, why we are going to stand by him through thick and thin. His opinion of us is, is it's mediocre, but as long as it's positive, we're happy with that. So that is uh, the king and the kingdom as it stands at this moment in time. As we now look to ourselves... We can see our stats here. We have the highest stat in diplomacy. Diplomacy is good for uh, basically other people's opinions. So uh, diplomacy determines how people view you and how you view other people. Marshal is good for leading uh, generals. Stewardship is good for taxes. Intrigue is good for assassination and and, and plots carried out by the um, by the spy master. And learning is about religion and technology. So that is a quick overview, whistle-stop tour of the various traits. Now speaking of the traits, we look at our stats and our, our personal traits here. Uh, we are a charismatic negotiator, which is why our diplomacy is high. We are lustful, which means we uh, really crave a bit of rumpy pumpy in the old bed, which is good for fertility and good for ensuring that we have a lot of children because at this early stage in the campaign as a mere count I think the most important thing that we try and, uh, try and achieve is ensuring that our family name continues it's no good conquering all of this and all of this and oh, I'm the king of the world if you have no children because you can't pass that, 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 that the titles on to your offspring so uh, his wife is also lustful which is why she is pregnant, <laughs> because they've uh, had a fair old time of it, shall we say, and leave it at that. He's honest, which means he it, he is a truthful man, and he's not good at plotting and scheming. He's content with his lot in life, and is patient. Not good traits for expansion. He had nothing as an orphan, and now he has been bestowed up with the title of Count and that for him is enough he is happy with that so we'll see how that pans out in the campaign and if things crop up that force our hand to help us expand our uh, our domain but for now that is how he is and of course he's greedy because he had nothing and now he has the ability to get what he wants and therefore he shall have it come hook or by crook I suppose in an honest way, of course. So that is a little bit about his t uh, his stats. His wife, well, she is 19. As I say, she's the daughter of the Count of Hereford. Count William of Hereford. He has uh, f a few children. His oldest daughter. And therefore, he is naturally our allies. Which means that we can call him into battle should we uh, fight one. So we have, what, one, we have one person we can count upon. His opinion of us is 15, our opinion of him, 
I don't know, I don't know how you find that out, but uh, do we just hover over? Yeah, 13. It's a mutual respect kind of thing. I mean, you're not best buddies with your in-laws, are you anyway? So, as we can see, he's an orphan. He has no, he has no uh, brothers, sisters, parents to speak of. He does not know who they are. We have a look at our vassals. Uh, because we account, our vassals tend to be mayors, bishops, and barons, who are rulers of the various uh, settlements within the land. Our court mostly have a good opinion of us, so we're not doing too badly. But courtiers are just members of court. They don't tend to be anybody important. They could be members of your council, they might be family members, but generally speaking, just, just nobility. And uh, currently I'm away leading troops in Worcester, as well as the king. So I'm in the king's army trying to quell the rebellions claims for independence. So that's a little bit about George and what the our current situation looks like. So whilst he's away, our wife is taking over, making sure that things are running smoothly. So uh, I suppose we'll go through each tab individually and just make sure that things are set up as we wish them to be before we start commencing the uh, campaign. So as we look to our council, our council members are all here, and now these guys carry out various tasks for us, and all these tasks uh, highlighted here. The Chancellor, whose primary trait is the state diplomacy trait, is responsible for improving diplomatic relations with our vassals. So our vassals, for instance, as I've already said, is a mayor uh, and a bishop. So any non-religious, any non-bishops basically, so mayors and barons we can improve our relationships with those guys if we have our Chancellor improve relations in the land. So to improve our relations with our Mayor, our Chancellor should improve diplomatic relations in Cornwall. Fabricating claims on Devon. That's what he's doing at the moment. Now fabricating claims works um, because to be able to conquer another land, you've got to have a valid claim more about those when they crop up of course but the if you don't have a claim like we don't have a, an official claim to Devon so we can't invade them so because we can't invade them we have to fabricate our own claim a false claim we're making a false claim on Devon so we can invade and that's what fabricating claims is it's fabricating making up a false claim so that you can wage war against a particular place and finally sowing dissent is all about lowering the relationship between a vassal and their lord. So if you want to lower the opinions of the vassals and try and sow dissent and, and besmirch the good name of the king, we could send out our chancellor to sow dissent in the various counties and, and, and dukedoms here to, to try and do that. So that is the role of the chancellor. The marshal, slightly more straightforward in that his job is to suppress revolt. So if there is a revolt occurring here or there is a revolt risk, we can send him in to lower that. Train the troops, which basically increases the size of our levies in a province, and also researching military technology, which basically gives us a boost to military, uh, military technological growth rate. A steward is responsible for collecting taxes, overseeing construction, which increases the construction uh, speed, but we're not building anything at the moment and also researching economy tech, boosting the economy technological growth rate. The Spymaster scheme increases the likelihood of intrigue events. Oh no, that's the wrong one, sorry, that's um, uh, Spy Network increases the likelihood of intrigue events. Scheming uncovers plots, so if somebody's trying to plot to kill you, if you have the uh, Spymaster uncover uh, scheming here, then uh, there's a likelihood you might uncover that plot and be able to deal with the person that's trying to plot against you. And the final one is studying technology. I think studying technology is all about gleaning in uh, technological growth from other places. Now, one of the most lucrative technological advanced places is, is 
the Byzantines, they are highly technologically advanced and therefore if we send our spy down here to study their technology, I think it provides a boost to our own technological rate. So that's why he's down there studying. Um, I'll leave that as it is for now. So speaking of our council members, the stats here determine how good they are at any of the jobs that you send them out to do. Any, any uh, council member with a stat lower than 12, for me, is a little bit inept. Not good at his job, and therefore should be replaced. Now there's two ways you can replace. You can replace directly from your council. Now if I try that, it would be no use because I've already done that once before. So all my council, all my, uh, all my court, all my courtiers here are useless, so uh, you can appoint from your own court or you can go hunting in the realm, in the world by searching all and then looking for all through all these people and trying to invite them to your court and then from there you can appoint them as a council member. Now I'm going to do that in an RP sense, maybe a little bit shady as a lowly count, having access to all this information is probably a little bit far-fetched. But for the purposes of a little bit of metagaming, I'm going to do it. Just to give, hopefully increase my stats, for instance, here and here. If it's below 12, I will do that. If it's above 12, I will stick with what I have. As I get a larger family, they will start to excel in various stats and I won't have to delve into the pool as often, but for now I will give it a bash. So I'm going to temporarily pause it because it will take me a while to filter through all the uh, all the people, and I will resume when I have found a suitable candidate.